Hi everyone, my name is Annie Lay, and I'm a fourth year med student here at UCR. I am a co-founder of the Health Equity and Structural Competency Collective. Um, it's been such a pleasure to put on this amazing opportunity that brings so many people together to gain perspectives, skills, and connections to better advocate for our patients and our communities. Today we have an awesome group of speakers, panelists, and trainers who will address local and global issues at the intersection of health and social inequity. Many significant issues call for our attention in this political moment, and although we're unable to address all of them in just this one day, we hope to provide meaningful examples of sustained actions, of concepts and principles that can drive our praxis in social medicine and solidarity in tandem with the social movements that are growing all around us. You have the program in hand, and that lists all of today's activities. Right now, I'd like to thank our major sponsors. The UCR School of Medicine Office of the Dean, thank you so much, Dean Deborah Dees, to the UCR Department of Anthropology, the UCR School of Medicine Center for Humanities and Medical Practice, the Arnold P. Gold Foundation, UCR Graduate Student Association, and UCR Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we have to acknowledge all of the people power that has made this event possible, including our volunteers, the folks who set up the space for us, tech in the back, um, uh, and all of the labor that that has entailed. And I wanna give special thanks to Michelle O'Corey, Kathy Krotz, Dean Deborah Dees, Drs. Juliet McMullen, Ann Cheney, and Seth Holmes. Without your groundwork and advising, none of this could have been possible. And in the spirit of Rupert and Jeanette Costo's founding relationship to our campus here at UCR, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kahuya, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous people, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work in these homelands. We think that this contextual perspective really grounds us in our endeavors toward health equity. In addition to our speaker program today, we're also exhibiting Migration Now, a portfolio of handmade prints addressing migrant issues from the art collectives Just Seeds and Culture Strike. Many of our speakers today are on the topics of immigration, detention centers, and deportation. And this is such a critical issue that touches many of us, especially here in inland Southern California. So we wanted to highlight that with the art that surrounds us today. We're also joined by several community organizations that are tabling at the lunchtime. And the UCR bookstore will be here at lunch onward throughout the rest of the day, selling titles from our speakers and other recommended reads. And stick around for our social community building reception at 4 to 5 p.m. with more great food and more opportunities to connect. We also have some raffle items which you can enter to win. Um, the links are on your tables and uh, on the slideshow that's circulating. Um, we have the pre-survey for the conference right now, so if you could do that on your phones or your computers, that'd be great. Um, and then if you're using social media today, please use the hashtag HowWeHeal. Uh, one important housekeeping note is that there are bathrooms outside the main exit to the left. And um, yeah, so we hope overall that this gathering will offer inspiration, insights, and new connections to propel us all in the long haul work of creating a more just and healthy world. Right now, I'd like to invite up Dean Deborah Dees, the Mark and Pam Rubin Dean of the School of Medicine and Chief Executive Officer for Clinical Affairs of the uh, Un University of California, Riverside. We're grateful to Dean Dees for supporting this student-led effort and this vision for uniting folks from different backgrounds toward the common goal of health equity. Thank you so much, Dean Dees. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to UCR School of Medicine. And also welcome to this exciting conference, How We Heal, Confronting Health Inequity and structure, Through Structural Competency. I would like to thank wholeheartedly Annie Lee, our conference director and co-founder of UCR Health Equity and Structural Competency Collective, 
and all of the students involved. I'm just so, so very proud of our students. And I'd like those students who were involved with planning this conference to stand so we could acknowledge them. Please stand. <laughs> and you may not have seen a lot of students standing and it's because they're still working. <laughs> you know, service, they really truly believe in service. And it certainly brings it to our mission of the School of Medicine to train this diverse physician workforce and to create programs both in clinical care and research to serve the underserved population and the people of inland Southern California. For those of you who are familiar with Southern California, inland Southern California, you know that we have about 35 primary care physicians to a population of 100,000. And what is really needed is upwards of 60 to 80 per 100,000. And when I say 35 to 100,000 of primary care physician, I'm not talking about just family medicine, but I'm talking about the swath of primary care. That is family medicine, internal medicine, OBGYN, internal medicine, um, general surgery. So imagine that, all of those specialties coming together. We only have 35 primary care physicians to 100,000. And no wonder the School of Medicine's mission is to train this diverse physician workforce. And we're training this workforce, hopefully, for the inland Southern California, or what I like to say, inland empire. We hope that many of our students will return to serve here. Now, when we talk about um, health disparities and health inequities. I couldn't help but reflecting this morning about it. Many of you know my background. Having grown up in a rural community, on a farm in rural South Carolina, 30 miles from Charleston. So I know all too well about health disparities. And I know all too well that the disparities of health doesn't just reside in health, but it intersects with employment, with housing, with the socio-political areas. And as healthcare providers, no matter if you're an MD or not, but you're clinicians, or even anyone who is lending support to the health care arena, you know that in order to really serve our patients, we have to look at all of those other factors that intersect with their health. And what we're really talking about here is justice. A lot of people don't think about it in that way, but we're really talking about justice. And I'm so pleased as I reflect back about the Institute of, of Medicine's report on health disparities in the early 2000s and what that report showed and how people moved from that report. And we had sort of an outburst of researchers and um, people in the healthcare arena rushing out to describe and to identify all of the health disparities. 
Well, we knew that there were health disparities, and we spent a lot of years identifying health disparities. And I always said, you know, we could describe it, we could name it, we could do whatever in terms of identifying these, but what are we going to do to move from just understanding that there are health disparities and talking about how we address them? And not only understanding and talking about how we in address these health inequities, but really teaching in the health professions area that as health professionals, we're not just supposed to be in our little ivory towers seeing our patients or working with our communities, but we have to get involved. And when I think about our students, like um, Annie and Michelle and Madeline, and I, I could just name all of them, but the students from the planning committee of this conference, they are activists. And a lot of times, people don't think that physicians and health providers, I think in and of itself, being a health provider or having interf an interface with the health field and serving in that niche, you are naturally an activist. And you are naturally there to get the justice that your patients so deservingly need. And you're there to be their advocate, to be on the front line, and be the voice for those who have been voiceless for so many years. So I'm excited about this conference, and I'm excited about the framework, the structural competency, that framework that was introduced by Drs. Hansel and Metzel and that framework that's now becoming integrated into the health professional field. So I want you to enjoy this conference. I'm going to be here most of the conference, and I'm planning to get as much out of it and be a sponge and take it all in. And I look out into the audience, and I see all of you. And as Annie described, and she thanked so many people for coming together to put this conference on and working together, she knows that this is what we are about at UCR School of Medicine, that cooperation and that collaboration. And it all ties into my favorite proverb, the African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I'm sure all of you will go together with us to get justice for those we serve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean Dees. Um, one important group I don't want to forget to thank is you all, our attendees. You all are community organizers, students, including undergraduates, grad students, medical students, um, health professionals who came here to entrust your Saturday with us. And uh, I really hope that you all are sponges today as well. Um, so thank you. And now I'd like to invite up Dr. Bruce Link, who has some words and the introduction to the keynote. Dr. Link is a distinguished professor of sociology and public policy here at UCR. With Dr. Joe Phelan, he has advanced the theory of social conditions as fundamental causes of disease. Dr. Link's work is on the connection between socioeconomic status and health, homelessness, violence, stigma, and discrimination. And his current work is on the consequences of social stigma for people with mental illnesses. So um, on that note, I also want to shout out the UCR School of Public Policy and the UCR, UCR Department of Psychiatry and Neuroscience as some of our sponsors. And let's welcome Dr. Link.
terrific. It was so great listening to Dean Dees and feeling the pride. And I want to shout out to her for creating the context that allowed this to happen. So I'm excited to be here today. My main job is to address our keynote speaker, Helena Hansen, whose picture you see there. But I want to say a few things about why I'm excited for the day. And Annie also asked me to say a little bit about how it connects to some of the things I've been interested in and that I'm currently interested in. So to take about 10 minutes to do that. And I'll try to do it faster since I know we're a little bit behind. So my main, one of my main reasons for being so excited is the two keynote speakers that you've picked for today. They're t terrific people. They're leading this great social movement and structural competence. I happen to know them both. I had no role in inviting them here. Um, but I was just so excited when I saw that they would be your keynote speakers. Um, I want to say uh, several things about the value and importance of this concept we're going to be investigating. And I'm going to touch on this notion of fundamental causes that uh, An uh, Annie mentioned in, my, in introducing me. I want to talk about a little bit about something I'm thinking about now, which I call diversions. And then I want to think about this as a social movement, which was also embedded in Dr. Dees' uh, comments. So for fundamental causes, uh, the idea here is that people use flexible resources of knowledge, money, power, prestige, and beneficial social connections to gain health advantage. These are things that we can use in different places and different times so that no matter what the conditions are, no matter what the risk factors for a disease are, no matter what the diseases are, to the extent that we know what to do about diseases, then people can use those flexible resources to gain a health advantage. What that tends to do is to reproduce associations between things like socioeconomic status and health in different places and at different times. And it tells us that the reason that then we have to have something like structural competence is that we have to deal with the inequalities too. We have to have a notion of justice, like D Dr. Dees said. So this is a connection to the fundamental cause idea of structural competence. It's a response to, to, the, uh, to the possibility that these things keep reproducing unless we address them directly. So di diversions, what do I mean by diversions? Well, diversions, I say, occur when health inequalities research turns the focus away from the actions of people with power and influence who act to advance the health circumstances of themselves and those in their circle of caring. And instead, the research looks for the source of health inequalities in them, the disadvantaged, in their traits, their behaviors, their cultural orientations, their genes, and their presumed inability to be resilient in the, in the midst of all the stress that's in their lives. Uh, and with the focus turned away from the key drivers, intervention and action can be misdirected. Structural competence keeps us focused on some of these major inequalities that drive the conditions that lead to health inequalities. So it's another reason I'm excited that structural competence helps with this. And the third thing I wanted to point out is that really all of you are, and maybe you're already thinking this way, but all of you were involved in a social movement. Something's happening here. And it's got this signal of a structural competence that you can latch on to. You've got leaders, you can form an identity around it, and it's going to take time. On the social realm of things, it doesn't happen like that. We can't give a pill. It takes time, a long time, and you have to keep going. And, it, and the way to do that is through a social uh, movement kind of thing, and I see this as that, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about it. So that's my blah, 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 how it connects to me and how I'm thinking about it. Here comes Helena Hansen. Uh, she has California roots. Grew up in Oakland. There's a picture of Oakland, and uh, uh, that's where she, she came from. And welcome back, Helena. We're glad to have you back. We might try to lure you here forever sometime. Here's her education. She got her uh, bachelor's degree at Harvard. And if you could see the picture, there's Harvard Yard. <laughs> then she went to Yale, and she got her MD in psychiatry there and her PhD in anthropology. And then, my good luck, she came to Columbia for two years to engage in the Health and Society Scholars Program that I was a co-director of. 
So we spent hours together talking about these issues in seminars and so on. Um, her current position is at, uh, as associate, oh, I wanted to say one thing about all that Ivy stuff. <laughs> She's got all that Ivy stuff and you can imagine two things happening. One thing you could imagine happening is that someone would absorb a lot of what those institutions could deliver to someone. That happened. The other thing you could imagine was a nose in the air, a little bit of snootiness. That did not happen. <laughs> You've got a wonderful person here who will be your, uh, your, your presenter. She's currently associate professor of anthropology, associate professor of psychiatry, and um, a research psychiatrist at the Nathan Klein Institute. Uh, here's a little bit about her scholarship. Uh, here's her book, uh, Addicted to Christ, which she just gave me a copy of this morning that she signed. Um, she's also done films. She tries to communicate in multiple ways, and she did a, a film called Managing the Fix. Um, anthropologists sometimes do things like this where they use another mode to try to communicate things about culture. And she has numerous papers, one about structural competencies, uh, one of them about structural competencies who was already mentioned this mor morning. But I hope you'll go look at some of her work on the opioid epidemic and on how racial stereotypes influence how that epidemic unfolds and how it gets treated. So Suboxone, where is Suboxone given in, in, in the society and where is methadone given? And the, you can see maps of how this unfolds. And then how is it, how, do we punish it or do we treat it? And where is it punished and where is it, is it treated? So she, she has evidence that in the upper middle class Staten Island area of New York City, it, it gets uh, diversion treatment, so uh, treatment. Whereas in the South Bronx, it's, it's penalized with imprisonment. So those, that's Helena Hansen, my, my introduction for Helena. And Helena, I want to invite you up. I look forward to your talk. I'm so happy you're here. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. So thank you, Bruce. Um, you're an incredible mentor and inspiration and mental note to self, too, that you're, awesome. you're the world's best person to have as an introducer. <laughs> because I understand that Bruce spent a long time searching the web for videos of my talks and taking notes. He really took this seriously, but a lot also really, I think, understands what I'm trying to do because he spent so much time with me. And um, I couldn't be more fortunate to be working with Bruce even now. Um, I really count my blessings. I also want to thank Annie Le and her collaborating organizers of this meeting. I'm incredibly impressed by the work that they've done to bring you all here. And I've already gleaned that you're coming from many, many different disciplines, specialties, places. So the team, Annie Le and her team, did an incredible job publicizing this and making an argument for spending this time on structural competency and justice and health. And I also want to thank Dean Dees and the support of the UC Riverside School of Medicine, School of Public Policy. Uh, there's a long list, but I think I'll, I'll just leave you with that for now. As Bruce mentioned, I am from California. This is a homecoming for me. And um, I thought I'd start with just a tiny story about what I brought to this kind of work, because I'm sure each and every one of you in this room has a story about what drives your commitment to justice and health. Um, it's, it's important to revisit that, I think. And so I thought I'd share that I didn't know until about 10 years into my medical training that I'd become a psychiatrist because of family tragedy. And it was family tragedy that was shaped by structural violence in the healthcare system and justice systems here. So I was born and raised in Oakland and Berkeley, California. Um, I grew up in an area that at that time was low income and kind of industrial wasteland, um, now very gentrified. But at that time, I was in grade school, I noticed more and more people appearing on the streets around me, people who seemed to be living in the streets. Um, and they were wandering, sometimes cursing to themselves. Um, my mother is a single mother, so working full time. So I often had to get myself home from the school, from the, uh, the bus stop after school. And I learned to run all the way home because I was afraid of these new neighbors that were living there. 
I didn't know it then, but what I was seeing was the effects of state mental hospital closures in California, massive closures of hospitals with no real backup plan in terms of community-based care or even housing. And um, suddenly, my favorite uncle became one of these people. So he showed up at my door, banging the screen door and screaming to get in. I didn't know it was happening. Um, he was in a psychotic state at the time, I later learned. He's somebody who'd started his adult life as a charismatic young African-American civil rights activist. But he ended his life in a state mental hospital. Uh, he actually got one of the few remaining beds there. And he died of antipsychotic induced heart failure there. He was only 35. He was one of two of my uncles to die in institutions in California due to badly managed mental health and addiction uh, problems. And looking back, it was my first lesson in structurally incompetent medicine. So I used college to run away from these kind of horrific experiences, and that's why I ended up on the East Coast for such a long time, as Bruce showed you. Uh, this was just as the AIDS epidemic was peaking. And in the 1990s, I took my first job after college working with community organizers and activists to stem the toll of HIV in New Jersey. That's where I was assigned for my work. It had the nation's richest suburbs, poorest cities, and in those poor cities, the highest rates of HIV infection among women and children. So we didn't have a language for it then, um, but I now, looking back, would say that we are practicing a form of structural medicine. So I saw people who were themselves quite sick in City Hall, storming City Hall for AIDS funding, staging die-ins against pharmaceutical manufacturers who fixed prices out of the reach of poor countries. And I saw them develop mutual aid, homegrown mutual aid networks to share information as it was coming out about HIV and AIDS. They were educating each other about new medications, clinical trials, safer sex. So here's my first slide. Oh, how did I get there? OK, so this is my first slide. Um, I saw AIDS activism lead to structural changes in medical practice to mandates for people affected by targeted health conditions like HIV to sit on scientific review bodies. This was a brand new idea back in those days. And I also saw community participation in public health campaigns. AIDS activism spread the gospel of harm reduction, of saving lives by meeting people where they are rather than punishing them for non-compliance, quote unquote. And I thought that by training in both social science and medicine, I would be able to import the structural intervention that I'd learned from AIDS activists into the mainstream of medical care. So that was my goal. And this is apropos Dean Deza's uh, statement, right? That to do medicine well, you're naturally an activist. Uh, the reason I chose this, this quote is just to highlight that structural medicine, that's what I'm calling it for now, but this idea that, as Dean Dees pointed out, you have to be an activist to practice good medicine. It's ages old, right? We could start in the 19th century. We could start well before. Um, the link between disease, social status, and living conditions has been documented for centuries. And so Rudolf Virchow, the 19th century founder of, mo founder of modern pathology, physiology, and social medicine, quoted here, um, he captured the political causation of a lot of health problems just three years after Frederick Engels, partner to Karl Marx, wrote about, writing partner of Karl Marx, wrote about epidemic mal malnutrition, infectious disease, and opium as consequences of working conditions in the Industrial Revolution in his book, The Condition of the Working Class in England. So this is, kind of, this is a long area of both medical practice and social science uh, theory. And then a century later, H. Jack Geiger became a figurehead for the 1960s health activism movement when national newspapers showed him writing prescriptions for food for malnourished black children in the Mississippi Delta. So he went on to found the network of federally funded community health centers that serve poor rural and urban neighborhoods to this day. Um, there was much that was left out of this image that hit the newspapers of him writing this prescription. Uh, and that is that he worked with a whole host of community organizers and activists in the Mississippi Delta to go well beyond that. So their work included creating um, a communal farm in which displaced former 
agricultural workers could cultivate their own food. Um, also, they had a clinic-based education center that had courses awarding general education degrees to local residents, and they even sent some of them to higher education to get licensed as health professionals and to come back and practice in their own community. And so um, Geiger and all of his community activist collaborators went for nothing short of a political economic restructuring of the poor communities that they serve. And I recommend that you search um, YouTube for a 20-minute documentary based on the story of this work in the Mississippi Delta. It's really inspirational. It's called Out in the Rural, as in the title of this book. So in fact, health inequality was at the center of civil rights activism in the 60s and 70s. You may have read Alondra Nelson's history of the Black Panther Party's community health screenings for TB, sickle cell, and lead poisoning their free clinics and food distribu distribution networks that identified health as fundamental to social justice. And as you'd see, if you also looked at the documentary called Palante, Siempre Palante, um, also the Young Lords Party uh, in Puerto Rican and Latinx neighborhoods from Chicago to New York City were doing very similar things. They ran free breakfast programs for children, community detox centers for people addicted to heroin, vans with mobile x-rays and skin tests for TB throughout the South Bronx, upper uh, Manhattan. Very impressive. So as you can see, this, is, this has a history. And I've only gone back to the 60s and 70s. You could go further back in time. But by the time I started medical school, the country had gone through the privatization of health care, the soaring profits in pharmaceuticals that we read about today, biotech and insurance industry profits. This was the era of Prozac and direct consumer marketing, making health care and, and pharma the single largest economic sector in the world. H. Jack Geiger's community health centers barely survived the slashing of funds for public health care in that era. And the social medicine that was fueled by the 60s civil rights activism that I talked about had been replaced by appeals to cultural competency. Now, very well-meaning uh, appeals to cultural competency, but the way that they played out in medical centers implied that the cultural beliefs of individual patients caused inequalities in health. So I was being formed a taught I was being taught a form of organized medicine driven by shareholders, growth targets minimization of risk of malpractice suits, a medicine preoccupied with diagnostic algorithms, decision trees, and manualized treatments that allowed no room for the lived realities of patients to enter into the room, let alone collaborations with their communities. So I was being trained for biotechnical competencies in a Fordist assembly plant style of medicine. This was the world of medicine and psychiatry that inspired me and physician cultural historian Jonathan Metzl who coined the term structural competency in his book, Protest Psychosis, to unite with colleagues in social medicine, including prolific scholars like Seth Holmes and Kelly Knight, who are in this room today, to promote the term structural competency. The idea was to replace culture with structure in order to call attention to the political economic inequalities that drive health inequality and to play on the word competency using it to signal a clinician's responsibility to intervene on institutions and policies that cause health inequalities. We thought that this language would support a shift in focus from the doctor-patient encounter to levels of disease causation and intervention above the level of individuals. But this shift demanded more than language. We had to answer two hard questions. One, how do you make structures visible in clinical practice? And two, what are the ways clinicians diagnose and treat pathological structures in reality? So to the first question of how to make structures visible to clinicians. I have students and residents, when I'm teaching, to revisit the premise for cultural competency. Some of you may be familiar with this, uh, this David Satcher's Surgeon General Report of 1999. And it called national attention to mental health disparities that persist today. Thanks to the report, we now know the statistics that in the US, black men are 48 times as likely to get a diagnosis of schizophrenia as white men, um, that Native Americans are four times as likely as whites to commit suicide. Asian immigrants often do not seek mental health care until their systems prevent them from functioning at all. 
these became sound bites as a result of this report. Since the 1980s, the primary way that clinical medicine has addressed these disparities has been through cultural competency training with the idea that clinical practitioners who take patients' cultural beliefs and practices into account will better engage them in care. So to expand this pro approach, we have to consider social structures as key elements of cultural process and as drivers of health outcomes. The word structure comes from the social sciences, where it refers to social systems and institutions ranging from neighborhood organizations to institutional sectors such as education, corrections, or housing that may not be identified as health providers, but that have a big impact on health, and also public policies that shape those institutions. And in clinical practice, structural intervention is what is done above the level of the individual patient. For example, a psychiatrist working with a local church to help it start support groups for people who experience traumatic violence, or, or working with schools to develop mental health prevention programs, or testifying to state legislators in support of housing for people with serious mental illness. Clinicians don't often look beyond access to treatment as a cause of health disparities. So I often start by teaching clinicians the concept of social determinants of health and its roots in epidemiological and public health research on population level patterns of disease and distress. So by the way, I know many of you already know this, um, but one of the most widely cited theories of how social inequalities drive health inequalities is that of fundamental causes. Your very own Bruce Link and his wife Joe Phelan developed this theory. Um, it's widely known in the social sciences and in public health, but has not, it is only beginning to penetrate into clinical uh, conversations. And so that is one of my roles, is to bring the theory of fundamental causes and um, studies of the mechanisms of how social conditions cause health inequalities into the conversation. And I find that social determinants of health are most visible when we look at populations rather than individual patients. So sometimes, um, even though the clues are there in patient histories, you know, when we talk with patients and learn about their histories of violence, institutional exclusion, deprivation, we even think about where they live and their exposures, it's there, but it's not quite as readily visible uh, in our individually focused patient histories. So I often start with population level studies. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this 2013 Institute of Medicine report. Raise your hand if you are, I'm just curious. Okay, so the sound bite from this report is, it's a comparison of the US with 17 peer countries, mostly um, Europe and Canada. Um, and the sound bite from it was that the US spends the most on healthcare and has the worst health outcomes, right? Um, and the explanation that the Institute of Medicine had for this was basically structural. So related to lack of universal health care, lack of safe walkable public space and public transportation, lack of public health oriented laws and institutions, including those surrounding firearms, food, and abusable substances. And finally, they, I quote from the report, social and economic conditions, higher levels of income inequality, and lower social mobility. Okay, so the Institute of Medicine came out strongly with this position. It was not picked up by the popular media to the extent that I would have liked, and definitely not within clinical training and practice circles. Here's another study that really highlights this. Uh, it's an international comparison that highlights structural determinants of health by the epidemiologists Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett that shows that countries with a high index of social inequality, that is a large income gap between rich and poor, report the worst mental and physical health outcomes. So the graph plots measures of inequality against, in this case, mental health, but the, the curve is actually the same for physical health indicators, right? Um, you can see the US lands at the highest end of social inequality and at the lowest end of mental health outcomes. So we have the worst mental health outcomes, uh, the highest inequality. I just wanna leave you food for thought with an unexpected finding of the study, which is that the wealthiest people in the most unequal countries have lower life expectancy than the wealthiest people in the more equal countries. I just want you to meditate on that for a second. What could explain that? Okay, but the soundbite from this study then was that inequality is unhealthy even for the rich. 
I study the white opioid crisis, quote unquote, and so that's something that also carries me in my work. How can social inequality, um, racial inequality hurt white people? That's, that's something to think about. All right, so in this country, speaking of race, racism is a primary driver of social inequality and therefore of poor health outcomes. It's not the only one, but it's a very strong one. So how does racism get under the skin? This is where many of my colleagues are doing their work. Research on the biological impact of racial discrimination, for example, um, the work of anthropologists William Dressler and Lance Gravely, show a linear relationship between blood pressure, HPA axis, otherwise known as stress hormone um, cycle activation. Okay, the darkness of skin color in the US, where there is a clear-cut social hierarchy by skin color, um, drives this relationship. But there is no such relationship in majority black area, uh, countries, such as West, in West Africa, where color does not have the same social consequences. It may have a social consequence, but it's not the same in that context, and you don't see a relationship between skin color and hypertension. Think about that for a moment. It's something in medicine we're taught is probably genetic, right? That blacks genetically are predisposed to hypertension. The same anthropologists in Puerto Rico found that self-perceived skin color, so self-rating of skin tone, but not objectively measured pigment correlated with hypertension. So how you perceive yourself in this color hierarchy drives hypertension. And although we often think of racial discrimination in terms of face-to-face -face encounters, in fact, institutional racism is an even stronger determinant of health. That is racism that is structured into institutions and policies. So for example, arrests in the, war, in the war on drugs have been geographically targeted to black and Latinx neighborhoods, and racial disparities in wealth drive in large part from residential segregation resulting, and resulting differences in home ownership and property values. Okay, so just as an example, um, redlining. Let's look at an example of institutional racism in that. Res how many have heard of redlining, by the way? Okay, great, this is, this is a well-informed group. So residential racial segregation has been institutionally enforced for decades with such things as redlining and mortgage lending and in small business lending, in which banks rank houses in ethnic minority neighborhoods as high risk and denied applicants credit. Uh, this was a common practice by American banks until it was outlawed in 1974. This is a redlining map generated by mortgage banks in 1932 in Philadelphia, just FYI. These patterns persist. Right? Um, on one level, this kind of practice, discrimination in mortgage lending, persists. And I can say that actually my husband and I were involved in a class action lawsuit just a couple of years ago against a mortgage bank, which we learned had charged African Americans higher interest rates. So it's illegal, but it happens still. Since most Americans hold their wealth in their homes, this leeches wealth from poor and um, poor neighborhoods of color, minor neighborhoods of color with each generation. And the patterns from this early redlining, redlining persist. So the current whites, um, currently whites in the US have a median level of wealth that's 18 times that of blacks. The devaluation of uh, neighborhoods of color is further exacerbated by government programs such as urban renewal and plan, plan shrinkage, which cleared, over the past few decades, cleared poor neighborhoods for developers and displaced residents, causing further depletion of their wealth and shredding of their social networks. So this has led to concentrated poverty in neighborhoods with few collective resources. It's led to street violence, poor educational quality, unemployment, all of which have major health consequences. So, what are the ways that clinicians diagnose and treat pathological structures like housing discrimination, right? That's a big leap to go from understanding something like redlining to what do you do as a doctor or nurse or pharmacist, a clinical practitioner? So here enters structural competency. I, I think that actually sounds kind of too self-assured, but it's, it's our aspiration, right? That with reor reorienting towards um, something like intervention at this level through structural competency that we can address it. All right, so I mentioned that structure signals institutions, communities, and policies operating above the level of the individual, and competency signals clinical practitioners' responsibility to take action. 
we have articulated a four-step approach, and when I say we, I'm talking about Jonathan Metzl and our collaborators, many of whom are here. We've articulated a four-step approach to structural competency training and practice. So the first step is to teach clinical trainees, many of us are working with trainees, to read patient presentations against the grain of individual risks or cultural beliefs and behaviors, asking what role neighborhood conditions, institutions, and policies play in producing the injury or disease that that patient has. And then the second is to help clinical trainees articulate patients' cases in terms of these neighborhood, institution, or policy level drivers to make them visible. And then the third step, and this is really tricky, but this is, I think, what you're going to be hearing about most of today. Um, it's to get experience, hands-on experience, working on structural intervention and thinking about what that could look like. Preferably outside of the clinic, so things that bring practitioners into contact with patients' communities. And then the fourth step, we borrowed from Melanie Turvalon and Jan Murray Garcia's idea of cultural humility. Um, so that was in response to the implied physician omniscience. Oops, I'm hopping ahead. Physician omniscience of cultural competency. So we don't want to we don't want to present ourselves as knowing everything about structure, because I can tell you clinicians don't get trained in structure, so we actually don't. So we need humility on two counts. One is to reach out to people who do know about structures and about community organizing and conditions as collaborators, and the second is to be patient. This is a different kind of intervention that takes a long time. It requires trust building, it requires relationship building, and actions over time. So what do structural interventions look like? Um, I've spent the past few years collecting cases of structural intervention to answer this question. This is a poster from the first structural competency conference, so to speak, that we put on. And actually, there are some people in this room who were there for the very first meeting and presented their work there, including Bruce Link. Um, so we've had a series of national meetings since then, webinars, special journal issues. And next month, we have a casebook a series of case studies that Springer Press has published for us uh, coming out, and it features the work of many of the speakers here today, including Seth Holmes, Kelly Knight, and Josh Neff. So you're going to get great examples of structural competency in action throughout the day, but I'm just going to quickly show you a few examples to illustrate how I think about different levels of structure in which we can intervene. Okay, so the first is within the clinic. Okay, this is the low-hanging fruit because we're used to working within clinics and um, thinking about what we can do there. So examples include, for example, prompts in electronic medical records that remind clinicians to ask patients during assessments about uh, social determinants of health, such as housing stability, food, sec food security, um, legal problems, right? And my colleagues at UCSF uh, Nancy Adler and Laura Gottlieb, who've studied this, have shown that this leads to more comprehensive treatment plans that include referral to, for instance, legal social services. And then another approach is medical legal partnerships that match clinical trainees with law students or pro bono lawyers to defend patients' rights quickly. Examples include pediatric clinics um, that, through these partnerships, force landlords to comply with lead decontamination laws or force schools to provide legally required support for learning disabled children. Psychiatrists can prevent their patients from getting evicted in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's health leads, which I won't spend too much time on, but it involves that next step of, after of writing a social prescription for social services, legal aid, and then student volunteers who help patients fill those prescriptions. The next level of structure is community engagement, and that's where I'm spending a lot of time these days. Um, I know that I'm running out of time, so I want to be brief, but basically I worked with an organization in Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York, which is the neighborhood with the highest density of public housing, very poor neighborhood with also high rates of psychiatric uh, distress and presentation to ERs. And um, the psychiatry residents that went there uh, worked on many different projects, including a needs assessment, a mental health needs assessment with community organizers that led things to the formation of peer-led support groups for people who'd experienced violent trauma, and um, collaboration with probation officers to catch 
patients with psychiatric histories that were decompensating so that they wouldn't be rearrested uh, or rehospitalized in response to their symptoms. And next, one of uh, my favorite examples from cross-sector collaborations. I mentioned collaborating with um, agencies that we don't think of as health providing, like schools, law enforcement. In this case, my mentor, Mindy Fully Love, who's a psychiatrist, um, she has been for decades now collaborating with um, architects and urban planners to racially reintegrate cities through public space, uh, rezoning. Um, and this is in response to her work on the health impact, the negative health impact of racial segregation in cities. So she's a psychiatrist of the city, so to speak, as opposed to an individual patient. And I'll just skip ahead to drug war policies. That's where I spend a lot of my time as an addiction psychiatrist. Um, and so, but it highlights that policy is a major driver of health inequalities. Clinicians don't get trained in how to advocate for policy at all, um, but they also, because they're healthcare providers, hold significant symbolic capitals when they do use their voices. So the idea here is to get clinicians trained in how to speak up for certain things that may not appear to be health issues, such as drug war policies, as health issues. Um, and that's what my, um, my co-author, uh, colleague Jules Netherland at the Drug Policy Alliance is doing in training clinicians in advocacy, policy work, and lobbying. And she's training them how to testify when new laws are proposed. So these examples, uh, and I, this is a slide just showing an organization that was founded by a collaboration of um, mental health providers and people in the criminal justice system who were dissatisfied with the system, channeling so many people with mental health problems into um, incarceration. Um, and they formed this punishment to public health to address policies and practices to divert people with psychiatric diagnoses from incar the carceral system. So these examples are meant to inspire and incite creative local problem solving. But it's clear that structural change won't go anywhere if we, I say we as clinical practitioners, and there may be some people in the room who are coming from outside of that world, but clinical practitioners have to work with others. Requires interdisciplinarity, collaboration with public health practitioners, lawyers, activists, and community organizers. And I invite you the generation gifted with structural awareness to figure out how to do so. Thank you. Thank you.